research was the thing that really brought this home, that we're, we're doing very different things in lots of ways. And it's clear that those who think of bioethics as a subset of philosophy tend to downplay the role of empirical work. Most moral philosophers believe that there are such things as moral truths. And in the same way that scientists put forward hypotheses in order, in order to attempt to get closer to the truth about the physical world, so moral philosophers attempt to get nearer to the moral truth by putting forward arguments for scrutiny. If these arguments are shown to be inadequate, then they're rejected for a superior argument. And this process allows us to gain a greater understanding of the moral world, to get increasingly closer to the moral truth about such issues. And so we can see that for most moral philosophers, while empirical work such as public consultations may be interesting, they can't provide the answers to the morality of the problem in hand. Now, the Wellcome Trust, I really like this article, but it seems to have disappeared off the internet, so don't waste time trying to find it. But it, it caricatured this approach to bioethics as an abstract exercise carried, over, um, carried on over sherry in the tutorial rooms of academic ivory towers. And I think there is that feeling that you know, philosophers see themselves above the world and are doing this as a very academic process. And the idea is that these sherry sippers are not much interested in the cultural codes of different societies. They believe that morality is not necessarily to be found in these codes. So, given that we've got these two different models of bioethics, one where people are looking at cultural codes, looking at what people think, and seeing that as important, and then another one where those things are really not seen as very important at all, where it's about reason, where it's about people sitting in their own rooms with maybe other philosophers scratching their chins and thinking about things. Where does that leave the future of projects like this and the, and the future of bioethics? <coughs> does it mean that we would be like we were at times in that room for that European project? where we've got sociologists and anthropologists and other people who do a lot of empirical work on one side of the room and the moral philosophers on the others and are not able to, to agree enough to even move forward with the agenda that we want to look at. I don't think that that is the case. <coughs> the moral philosophers that are engaged in bioethics, I don't think, are sherry sippers in this sense. Well, they believe that what is morally right and wrong can't be determined by empirical research. Their role is not simply to determine what is right or wrong, but to help to determine what society's response to such dilemmas should be. So while moral philosophers may, through reasoning and argument, establish a strong case that something is morally wrong or right, it may be that this is not the factor that determines what happens in terms of policy. Hopefully it won't be the case that we'll have this impasse where these two sets of people really can't get on and can't get on with the, the issues that really need dealing with. And that I don't think that most of the moral philosophers that deal with bioethics are these kind of sherry sippers that the Wellcome Trust was describing. Because we see ourselves as doing something different than, than sitting in an ivory tower. The reason we're in these meetings, in these groups, is that we're trying to look at policy and we're trying to figure out, yes, what the morally right thing to do is, but also how that translates into policy and how things will work in, in the real world. So moral philosophers do think that the only way to find out what, what the right thing or the wrong thing is to do is through this reasoned argument. But that might not be the only thing that determines the policy in the end. So many moral philosophers have the view that the human fetus has no moral status, that it doesn't have a right to life. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they'd come up with policy that would allow people to do anything to that fetus. Um, I put soup or earrings. But they, that isn't the case that people would sit there and say, well, because there is no problem, that they have no interest, that that would be the case. Because... We could see that to do that would cause a lot of distress to people and it wouldn't actually gain a great deal. And another example is one that I've written about, which is the uh, reckless transmission of HIV. Now, most people would see that anybody who transmitted HIV through sex to somebody else, knowing that they've got HIV, has done something very bad. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we want to criminalise that 
moral wrongdoing because it may not be that that's the right way to deal with this. If we're looking at trying to reduce the amount of people infected with HIV, maybe actually criminalising the, the transmission might be counterproductive. It might <coughs> mean that we don't manage to achieve these public health aims. And the evidence that we need, the moral philosophers need, about the distress caused by fetus misuse or the evidence that criminalisation of HIV transmission is counterproductive will come from empirical research. And without these judgments, these are just unsubstantiated intuitions from philosophers, and philosophers don't like unsubstantiated intuitions. So we, we need the, the empirical work to even get to the point where we're, we're thinking about policy. So as I say, I don't think that the moral philosophers at least engaging in bioethics are these kind of sherry sickers that are completely <coughs> divorced from reality and, and not thinking about the things that are important. And I think it's really important to recognise on the other side of the coin that moral philosophy isn't some dark mystic art that only people who call themselves philosophers can do. People, the sociologists, the historians, everybody else that sits in a room doing bioethics are doing some kind of moral philosophy as well. They're arguing, they're putting forward arguments. They may be more at home with empirical research, but they're all doing this kind of work as well because all moral philosophy is is a way of arguing, a skill about argumentation. So it's not something that you know, isn't accessible to people. We all, most of the people who are here who are moral philosophers teach this dark art to people all the time and it, you know, it, it can be taught and people it's not, a, it's not a kind of area that people can't get into so on one side we've got moral philosophers who are have to see empirical work as important and on the other side we have people that I guess their bread and butter is the empirical work who are actually engaging in moral philosophy as well and I think it's important to see that So what's the future of bioethics? So I think the future is the kind of interdisciplinary approach, the, the model one that I put forward. But one where these terminological disagreements have been clarified and then just put aside. So it's important that we recognise the, the different roles of the people engaging in bioethics. That moral philosophers have a particular view of how you find out about what's right and wrong. And that usually doesn't involve, at least at the level of kind of really looking at the ideals of what is right and wrong about an issue, a very strong role for um, empirical work. Whereas other people doing work in bioethics have a very different view and a very different set of skills, although there is obviously some overlap. And I think once we recognise that people are just talking about two different ways of thinking about bioethics, and that we recognise that the people doing bioethics have these different kind of priorities and different kind of skills that they can bring to the table, then we can move forward. And for me, the future of bioethics is looking at this kind of interdisciplinary approach so that hopefully we can fund both the sherry sippers who are dipping their toe into the empirical work and the people working in the other fields that maybe have more empirically based work but that we can work together. And as I, as I say, for me, it was just important to get that cleared up in the first place so that we can actually work together in this very inter interdisciplinary way and move forward without all of these problems of description and um, definition holding us back. Thanks. <coughs>